Welcome to Bar Chart's weekly series of webinars designed to help you, the trader investor, better understand a variety of trading ideas and strategies, as well as the pages and tools Bar Chart provides to help you to make a more informed investment decision. Today's subject, market momentum and sediment. Now, I remember a high school physics teacher explaining momentum, and he said that the more momentum that an object has, the greater the opposite force or a longer amount of time to bring that object uh, to a halt. And he said, you know, if you drop a bowling ball from a window, it has its greatest momentum just before it hits the earth. He also went on to say that, you know, force acting on an object for a given amount of time will change that object's momentum. In other words, an unbalanced force always accelerates an object, either uh, speeding it up or slowing it down. Now, I know what you're saying, right? Right about now, you should be asking yourself, is this a physics lesson or is this a webinar about momentum and sediment? Well, to be honest to you, it's a little bit of both, right? What if we thought about the market as an object with mass? Then the force that creates momentum could be sediment. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is uh, John Rowland, Bar Charts Head of Trading and Education. And today we're going to discuss these forces behind market momentum, the tools to measure and calibrate them and hopefully to explain how to find trading opportunities as our bowling ball is dropped from a window or better yet when it hits the earth with me today is our moderator and my partner bar charts project director jean baker hello jean good afternoon john how are you i'm fine and yourself i'm doing great here I bet you would have never thought I'd be describing markets as dropping a bowling ball from a window. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It does. But, Gene, there are a lot of similarities between the physics of linear momentum and market momentum. So before we get to that, a little business. All right, today's session is for educational purposes only and all trading and investing has risk. We at Bar Chart recommend that you consult with a qualified financial professional to determine whether trading is suitable for you in light of your financial condition and your ability to bear risk. Today's examples are in no way or should not be considered an endorsement or construed as a recommendation to purchase or sell any particular asset or security. And under new circumstances, shall we be liable for any loss or damages that you might incur as a result of trading investment activity based on information or material that you receive through bar chart. All right. Okay. So as I alluded in the opening, momentum is this physics term whose formula is mass. Momentum is equal to mass times um, of velocity right now market momentum can be defined as market sediment or this aggregate rate of acceleration over a period of time right can be used to measure our market sediments right uh, that is supporting our trends and if you think about it this is kind of part of that equation right mass and force Turns out there's actually is a formula for market momentum. Mass price minus X number of days of closing prices. In other words, if the last price is above X amount of days other closing prices, then the market has positive momentum. If the last price is below an X amount of days uh, closing prices, then market has negative momentum. All right. So market sentiment, right? Well, that refers to 
um, this kind of overall attitude traders have towards the market. In other words, a feeling or a tone, uh, the crowd psychology, right? As it's revealed through activity, right? Buying and selling, volume, right? And market movement, trends, right? The basis of a lot of technical analysis. But also we can look at market sentiment in terms of a big picture, right? Rising prices are bullish, uh, a bullish sentiment, and falling prices uh, tend to be a bearish sentiment, right? Uh, we'll talk about market sentiment in terms of strength and direction. I want you, when we do this segment, think about moving averages, right? And their angle of inclination, their slopes or their their rate of change, right? Is our moving average turning upward or is it turning downward or is it moving sideways, right? But also sentiment can be thought of as a pendulum as it swings back and forth when investors sentiment swings too far to one side, for instance, overly bullish, right? If everybody bought, then who's left to buy? Momentum can swing back in the other direction. Now, this could be in the short term or it could be uh, in the long term. Now, there are many ways to measure market sentiment. As a matter of fact, all technical analysis in one way or another looks to quantify sentiment, that emotional aspect which brings investors to buy or sell. Now, but for today, what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on five concepts, right? First, uh, high to low, or sometimes referred to um, market breadth and, uh, or market internals. Uh, we're going to look at moving averages, right? The propensity of price to stay above an upsloping average and vice versa, price below in the downsloping average. But also the speed or that velocity, the angle of our trend, that momentum. We're going to look at volume and open interest and use volume as an indication of market participants, that activity, right? We're going to use volume to validate the quality of the price that we're going to see. Now, the concept of open interest is really for futures and options, and we won't have enough time to go down the futures road, but we'll look at options. And there's two reasons why most investors uh, use options. And one is to seek opportunities, and the other is to reduce risk. And we'll discover that in our session today. We're gonna look at the VIX, this volatility index, this is a measurement of the anxiety of the market. Either is the market anxious or is it calm? And what is behind the VIX? Or a more sophisticated advanced analysis of options activity, something called the put-call ratio. All right. So, what I've done here is I'm in bar chart and I've gone to the stock section where it says market momentum. And this is where we can start to look at our market breadth or those internals. Right. And what we see here first in this pie, this little half circle pie chart is a one day shot snapshot of stocks that have either advanced or decline compared to yesterday's closing prices. In other words, what we're seeing here is a one day's momentum, right? A one day's picture of momentum. Now, in general, on any given day, uh, you will typically see percentages swing between 60 and 40. They kind of stay in that range, right? Right around 50% uh, in a normal, quiet day, right? When percentages start to widen, when we get above 60 and 40, um, this is an indication of increasing 
momentum either to the upside or to the downside. But also when they get to extremes, when our percentages here, let's say get over 85% or 90%, uh, this is an indication that the sentiment of the market has swinged potentially too far to the upside or too far uh, to the downside. Now there's other information that you can see um, here. For instance, how many new 52 week highs or new 52 week lows, a uh, number of shares, advancing shares versus uh, declining shares, uh, volume. And so you can see for today, you know, we're above um, that 60 40 comparison. We're at 73% versus 25 for the New York Stock Exchange. And if we look at the NASDAQ, it's around, you know, it's right around that 60-40, right? So what is this telling us? That today market has a positive momentum and more stocks are going up uh, than down. All right, the next thing we can use is this high and lows. Here we can decipher price movement in the short and long term and the number of percentage of stocks that are above or below a higher low over multiple time frames. So again, if we look at the overall market today, we can see about 30% of all stocks or all equities uh, are making a new 52 week, excuse me, new five day high. If we look at the New York Stock Exchange, we see that that percentage is a little bit higher, about 36%. And how many are actually making new five days lows? Well, 14%. So again, in terms of market internals here, we do see that more stocks are exhibiting an upward momentum versus downward. But also what we want to do here is look at a comparison of um, other time frames. So what I want you to do is when you look at this section, is I want you to ask yourself three questions. Is the percentage rising or falling? This is something where you will come on a daily basis. This is kind of really where you're going to start your day as a trader compared to what has had happened from the day before. Is it rising or falling in the short term? How does that compare to longer time frames? And is the short term percentage uh, with or against the greater overall trend? Now, if it's with a trend, that's what we would consider an impulse as the market moves higher. If it's against our trends, then that would could be considered a correction. Now, if I look at the data that I'm seeing here, yeah, we see about a third of all stocks uh, are above their five-day moving average. But if we look at just a little bit to the right, three months, six months, 52 weeks, very few stocks are making those newer highs. So this momentum seems like it's an impulse in the short term, but it's not really gathering strength in the longer term. If we saw a little bit higher percentages in some of these months, uh, time frame months, then that would be a signal of a greater uh, momentum. But right now, what we're just seeing it is it seems like it's mostly uh, in the front of our time frames. All right. So if you really want to get deep into the weeds, right, this is kind of a big picture. If you really want to get deep into the weeds, one of the cool things that bar chart does for you is up here where it says details. Now there's a details here and there's a details here. Inside the details, bar chart has very special symbol symbology for you to look at in other words, to look at charts or to decipher uh, a much greater granular um, market internals. So one of the ones that, you know, there's a lot of ones that you can look at based on advance and declines, uh, volumes, um, you know, different markets. Excuse me, that was my phone. Apologize. And so let's look at this one. This is the total advance and decline differences. And I'm going to go to an interactive chart here. 
And this is all of our stocks. And what we're going to look at is this is a difference in positive price movements versus negative price movements. And you can see this is kind of a mishmash, but we'll look about how to decipher this type of chart in a few minutes. What we're going to look for is outliers. But what is going on today? Well, you can see that here's our zero line that a majority of stocks in this terms, about a third, is above yesterday's closing prices. All right. Um, if I wanted to be even more granular, I could go to a specific market. Here is what stocks in the NASDAQ are making new highs and low, that difference, right? So on a one month basis. So here what we see is, yeah, we see on a one month basis on the NASDAQ right now, there's 232 more highs and there are lows but we can see that recently what we saw is that there was more stocks that were making new lows than highs and even though this momentum is moving higher in terms of less stocks making new lows we're only just starting to see more stocks making new highs so what we're really seeing here in this process is is probably a bottoming action less stocks making new highs and now momentum shifting to more stocks making excuse me less stocks making new lows and more stocks making new highs if i wanted to look at a, a higher uh, time frame now here is a six month highs and lows and again we're going to see a kind of the similar uh thing right less stocks making new six months lows and we're only just starting to see more stocks making six month highs so again a maybe a transition from a trending market that had been going lower to maybe turning to the upside again in our market momentum page you can find those granular symbols in the details section, okay? All right, so the third part of our momentum page is this market performance indicator. Now, like our highs and lows, here we can dissect the market in terms of moving averages. Uh, we're going to use moving averages as a confirmation of price activity. In other words, in an uptrend, right, prices stay above their moving average. Um, and the longer the time frame we look at, the more significant that trend. Okay, again, so let's look at in each individual time frame well over the five days moving average we can see that there has been uh, a slow rise in number of stocks that are above their five-day moving average see last month only about half were above their five-day moving average today we're seeing about 70 percent are above the five days so we're seeing momentum is increasing um, in the short term right if i look at a longer period of time frame, let's say 100 days, yeah, we do see that less stocks were making new lows or less stocks were making new highs, and now momentum has shifted to the positive. But again, if we look at what is going on today, only about half of all the stocks that we're looking at today, or equities, are above their 100-day moving average, so kind of a neutral market. Now, a lot of times when in other um, webinars that I've done, uh, we talk about trend and momentum and movement of prices in terms of, uh, you know, tides and waves. So those of you who've been, you know, come consistently to uh, some of our sessions. So what we're looking here is um, is the big picture, really the ocean, right, the large ocean right and what we want to do is well first let me go here where it says dollar bcmm and if i click on that that's going to take me 
uh, to this page, and I've already jumped ahead to the interactive chart page. And what this does is it allows us to look at the big picture in terms of what stocks are advancing and the number of stocks that are advancing versus the number of stocks that are declining. And so what we want to look at are outliers. In other words, we want to see when this momentum indicator is at extreme values, right? And then we'll ask ourselves another question. Are these swings a one-day event, right, a one wave, or are they a series of positive or negative, right, in other words, a rising or falling tide? So I've highlighted three uh, very specific uh, examples of the market momentum index. Now, the way we read this here is here's 100, and 100 is what we would call our zero line. And so any number above 100 is telling you that there is more stocks that are advancing than stocks that are falling. Uh, if it is below 100, then it's more are declining than those are uh, rising. And about 102 on the upside and 98 on the downside, if we talked about standard deviations and probabilities and that kind of thing, you can think about those as two standard deviation movements in terms of how many more stocks are advancing versus how many are declining. So again, we wanna look for these outlier event, events that are closer to this 102 and 98. Now, the first one that I have highlighted here is September 20th, and you can see that you know we are well below uh, that 98. All right, so let me go back to my slides. All right, so here is the stock market momentum daily stock activity page, which I just went through with you guys from Monday, September 20th, that day when we had that big outlier event. And what we can see here is in the snapshot of the more market momentum for this one particular day, yeah, we see a large amount of momentum to the downside. In other words, a lot more uh, stocks that are declining than rising. Matter of fact, for the New York Stock Exchange, 93% of all New York Stock Exchange stocks were declining that day. And if we look at the advancing volume versus uh, declining volume, it's almost 30 to 1. Again, NASDAQ, um, same thing, about 88%. So what we're seeing here is a large market momentum to the downside and a one day event. And it's also telling us that. The sediment is very, very bearish. Again, let's go and look at our new highs and new lows, right? Overall market, only 6% um, were making new five-day highs, where almost two-thirds of all equities were making new five-day lows. If we looked at just the stock market, you can see that the value is even larger, three-quarters of all the NYSE stocks are making new lows, right? A lot of short-term momentum to the downside. But again, what did we say? We want to ask ourselves that question. Is price moving in direction with my trend? And how does it relate to other time frames? If I just go out to, let's say, three or six months, and I'm looking at the New York Stock Exchange, only 20% of stocks on this particular day were making new three-month lows. 13% were making six-month lows. So the question now is, is this the beginning of a new downtrend or is this just, just an impulse or a correction based on the trends that have been uh, already in place? So what in this scenario, I think what we could say is, yeah, we see a lot of short-term momentum to the downside, but this might just be a correction uh, from our longer-term trends. All right.
Here's our performance indicator. Again, if we look at that five-day moving average, right, for today, 13.78% are above the five-day movement. That means 87 or 86% uh, are actually below the five-day moving average, right? Uh, again, look at the 20-day, right? Looks like about 72% or 71%. But if we look at, let's say, 200-day moving averages, you can see that we're kind of right at that 50-50, right? So yeah, short-term momentum is down, long-term momentum still kind of going sideways, right? And look down below there where it says percentage of large cap stocks and their moving averages. Again, look at the S&P, right? Only 6% were above their five-day moving average. That means 94% of all stocks in the S&P were below their five-day moving average. But again, let's look at a higher time frame. We can see that a 100-day moving average, it's about 50-50. In other words, half above, half below. 200-day moving average. Almost two-thirds of all stocks in the S&P on this day were still above the 200-day moving average. So remember what we said, stocks that are in an uptrend tend to stay above their moving average. So what is this telling us? Well, in the longer-term trend, more stocks are in an uptrend than in a downtrend. In the short term, more stocks are in a downtrend than in an uptrend. So what are we seeing here? Again, probably a correction in the short term compared to the long term. Let's look at energies, for instance, right? 95% of all stocks on this particular day in the energy sector for the S&P were below their five-day moving average. But their 50-day and their 200-day, 50-50 and almost 60%. So again, maybe this might be a trading opportunity for us. So this is an outlier event, this 90% day. So there are some rules and things that you can think about in terms of 90% days. All right, so the first one is that it's really kind of a warning sign, right? And it's really telling you that there might be a danger or that investors mood or sentiment is in panic mode, right? But if we look at price as it relates to most recent highs, in this case, all-time highs, a lot of times what will happen is you will see one of these events right after the market makes a new high. And these are actually corrective phases and this is healthy for our markets especially markets that are have very strong up trends now if we saw a series of 90 percent down days in a row maybe we had one day and then the following day or a day later we had another 90 percent day the more 90 percent days we get to the downside 90 percent down days actually increases the probability of having more usually another one within 30 days but in this example here, if we get a 90% down day after making a new all-time high or a new high, uh, relative high, then a lot of times what will happen is we'll see a period of rallying right after it, uh, a period of about two to seven days. And if we see a 90% up day, after one of these 90% down days, then that is actually a signal of a major reversal. Now, you might actually sometimes see a 90%, uh, excuse me, uh, a series of two 80% uh, days, right, back-to-back. Uh, -back. That is also, you can also look at, at that. So that would be a signal of a major reversal. Now, we didn't get that after this 90% down day, right? So, one of the other things that we can start thinking about in terms of these momentums one way or another is we can start talking about volume, right? So here's the S&P SPY, right? And Charles Dow, the creator of the Dow Index or Dow Theory, believed that volume indicated a accurate price more accurate price and 
that volume activity tends to lead um, prices, right? And Dow also felt that a substantial increase in volume often preceded a significant price movement, right? So again, let's look what is happening here, right? We have a 90% down day on a big volume, right? This is telling us our sentiment is way over extended to the downside and it could precede a big price movement. Now it could be precede a price movement to the downside, but once price stabilized and once we got above the previous day's highs, that would have been a signal for you that this was an outlier event where the momentum had swung too far uh, to the downside and that now it's going to swing back uh, to the other side. Notice that here's our big volume day that precedes a price movement. And what is that price movement, right? We said two to seven days and we got a three day, four day rally. All right. Now, remember I showed you the um, energy sector of the S&P where two thirds of the energy sector was still above the 200 day moving average. Okay, so what we're looking here at these spaghetti strings are representative of moving averages. Uh, the red is our 20-day moving average, the blue is our 50, the, black, the purple is our 100, and our black is our 200. And just as we saw in the highs and lows scenario of the market, we see short-term momentum is down, where long-term momentum is moving sideways, still, still trending upward. And you can look at price action here. You can see we were kind of were in a range. And then we had that 90% sell-off, right, that overzealousness of the market. And this could be a sign of market capitulation. Again, a buying, potential buying opportunity. Now, it's very difficult to stand in front of a falling knife, right, and try to catch this falling knife. Again, maybe at this point you would set part a set of rules that allows you to wait for some form of confirmation in terms of that price is now going to stop falling and start rising. Remember, momentum, right, force that is moving a market in order to reverse it has to be a larger force. In other words, buyers, right, buying the dip. So if we see a large amount of buyers, we're going to see a large amount of activity. And what activity are we going to see? Volume. And notice that on this day here, this arrow day, where we went back up, not only did we go back up on this particular day, but we took back both the 200, the 100, the 50, excuse me, the 200, the 50, and the 20-day moving average on an up volume day, big volume day, almost the same amount of volume as we had on that 90% down day. And then what did we see afterwards? Rising volume, right? Dow's theory, right? Volume is a predictor of price movement, right? Rising volume, and you can see that the XLE since that day has been up about 20%, right? Now, what is price doing? right? Price is kind of going sideways. What's volume doing? Well, volume has dropped off significantly, right? So the momentum of the market has definitely slowed. Now, we would need a larger amount of volume to give us an indication of the next leg in the market, all right? So let me go back to the S&P. Actually, let me change this back to the SPY. And let's go back to that market momentum, all right? So there are two other outliers here that I wanted to look at, um, the August 27th and the July 19th, all right? So again, here we see that we had an outlier to the downside, a little bit more selling than buying. Now we didn't get really down below 98, but notice what happened on this day, that. In the beginning of the day, 
more stocks were down, but by the end of the day, even though more stocks were down than they were up, there were less stocks. The candle actually went up. There were less stocks that were lower from the morning uh, to the close. And then what do we see? The next day, right, we saw a lot more stocks that were advancing. So what we see here is a swing in momentum in this momentum indicator, all right? So let's go back to the S&P. Here's me the SPY. Here's that July 19th, that big volume day, Dow Theory. That big volume days precede price movements, significant price movements. What did we say? We want to look to see what that short-term momentum or that short-term sentiment, is it with our trend or is it against our trend? In this case, it was against our trend, downside which means that this is a buying opportunity or looking for a correction in this uptrend. And that's what exactly uh, what we saw. The other date we talked about was the August 27th date. Again, let's go back to the market momentum. And you can see we had an outlier to the upside, right? A big thrust of market of stocks that are performing are going up versus those that are going down. And again, if I look at that day, here it is, August 27th, this was the day the market made a new all-time high. What it happens afterwards, right? Well, here we can see that after that initial thrust, volume did not come through. Matter of fact, if you looked at this breath during this period when we were making smaller and smaller higher highs all time highs actually there was a few days in there where the breath was actually a bad breath it was below 50 percent advancers than uh decliners but then we do see a spike in volume that precedes a price movement which led to our 90 percent capitulation day which gave us another buying opportunity all right um before i move away from this uh some of you who have uh, been in some of my other webinars one of the ones that i did was understanding candlestick theory and in there there's a um a formation that i talk about as a three candle drop and we talk about that as a candlestick formation that shows us these capitulation type days and typically that third day that drop that third day drop you will see a very high percentage day. If you see a high percentage day, like a 90% day, and you also see it on a candlestick formation, then you would set about the rules, which I explained in that uh, webinar, how to uh, take a long trade. All right? Okay. So let's do this. Let's go back to my slides. All right, let's talk about the VIX for a second, all right? And the VIX is a little bit more an advanced measuring tool in terms of market sentiment, right? And so what is the basis of the VIX? Well, first of all, the VIX is the CBOE, Chicago Board Options Exchange uh, Index, and it's in real time and it is a measurement of expectations. That's a key word here, expectations of volatility of the S&P 500 index options and so this expectations is a forward-looking leading indicator for us right of market volatility this is really a window into what our institutional traders activity is so it's often referred to as the fear index right because it helps to quantify a measurement of market risk this volatility uncertainty in market or market participant investors sentiment so as a result uh, a rise in implied volatility um, as investors reposition their portfolios because they perceive market uncertainty or risk will buy put options and so a rising volatility, rising investor fear, and a rising VIX usually 
during market declines. And conversely, when volatility falls and fear falls, the VIX falls. And that's usually during times when the market rises. So this negative correlation of rising VIX and falling market and falling VIX and rising market can be used as a contrarian indicator. Now, we need to wait for the VIX to make extreme highs or lows. When that market sentiment swings too far to one side or the other as it goes from anxiety uh, to calm. Now, the old floor adage was when the VIX is high, it's time to buy. And when the VIX is low, look out below. All right, so let me go back to bar chart and I'm gonna put up the VIX here. And so, first of all, um, I'm, I'll explain to you what these colored boxes that I created, what they mean. Um, but let me just give you kind of some historicals here. So the VIX, uh, historically, the highest VIX reading was 82.69%. Uh, the lowest was 9.14%. Now, in general, typically the VIX ranges, you can see kind of between, let's say, 16 and 20. That's its comfort zone, right? And as it gets above... 25, it becomes elevated, right? Telling us that there's more anxiety or uncertainty or risk, perceived risk in the market. And when we get above 30, well, then now we're in what we would call a high implied vol volatility environment, um, high anxiety, so to speak. Um, on the downside, right? A below uh, 15 is difficult for the VIX to get to. It's very difficult for the VIX to get below 15. But when it gets below, let's say 16, then that is an indication that there is a certainty or a complacency about the market, about risk. In other words, the market feels calm and comfortable. And this is a bullish uh, a sentiment, right? But when we get too low on the VIX, this tells me that the market participants don't fear a downside, and that could be dangerous. Now, the boxes that I've just drawn here for us for this uh, segment, the greens represent where the VIX goes from low to high, a rise in uncertainty, a rise in risk, and the red is that low complacency. In other words, the market feels very comfortable. It believes that the prices are going to go higher. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm just change this chart around a little bit. So first thing I'm going to do is so we can make this assessment. I'm going to change this to a line chart. And now you can kind of see that, right, that um, where the VIX is peaking or trothing so to speak and i'm going to come up here into the compare and i'm going to add the s p now i could do the s p as a line but i'm going to do it as a candlestick stick chart and now you can really kind of see what we're talking about this inverse correlation between the vix and the s p so first of all, let's go and look at our 29, uh, excuse me, September 20th day, right? What did our VIX do? Well, it got up elevated above 25. That is an indication that market sentiment is swung too far to the bearish side, and that could be a potential buying uh, opportunity. VIX is high, time to buy, right? But we also said that the VIX is a leading indicator, right? And so you can see that on the 15th, this is where the VIX started to rise, right? This is where in institutional traders were starting to think that there is a higher probability that prices were going to go down than go up, or there was an uncertainty 
right? Could have been news stories, could have been a lot of, um, you know, maybe earnings or something to that effect that it could have drove them to buy more puts and drive the VIX up, a leading indicator, right? If we go back uh, to that July 19th day, again, right, where the VIX became a little bit elevated, right? And again, look at that leading indicator, right? It started really back on the 14th when the market had made a new high and didn't fall through. So traders was like, hey, maybe I need to buy some insurance in case this is the all-time high or this is the top, right? If we look at um, when we made the all-time highs, right? VIX is low, look out below, right? So again, market sentiment at this point was very bullish, but we didn't get that volume, that validation that we are going to go higher, that this is an, a strong high, right? Now, I'm not predicting what is going on, but we can see that our VIX is very low as the S&P is going up. Now, if we go back to the S&P itself, the SPY, as market participants are feeling calm, understanding that they believe that it's bullish, the VIX is telling us that, right? They don't have a fear, they're not buying puts. But look at our volume, right? not a confirmation, right? So this could be a cautionary tale for us moving forward that we might be coming into a topping action. Now, what we would see, what we would want to see is that the VIX start to turn up. In other words, get it back above 16, 17, 18. And that would be that confirmation that our in institutional traders are buying puts and they're thinking that maybe this is a potential top, all right? Okay, now, cautionary tale here about getting reliant on this VIX as an indicator. Again, I want you to use this as a secondary indicator, right? I want you also to make sure that you look for these outliers in the VIX in terms of sharp movements one way or the other but also what is going on with our trends, right? Is our trend up, is our trend down? Is our price movement in the short term up or down, right? And is there that volume uh, to validate that price movement? Okay. So I see some questions popping up. Um, let me see, I'm gonna pause here for a second before we get to our last segment. Um, Gene, any, um, I see a couple of our regulars in here throwing in a couple of questions. Any particular questions that, or a couple of questions that are popping up together? Well, uh, let's see. A couple people have asked if your slides are going to be available, and you know, don't don't go and show them at this point, John. When we go to the end of the webinar and we talk about next week's session, I'll have you show them our new uh, archive page. There is a place for you to get the slides from today's session on the archive page. Uh, and for those of you who are asking whether a replay will be made available, yes, you will get an email with a link to the recording later on today. Uh, so we will show you where to, where to find the archived session and where to find the slides for today um, toward the end of the session. So hang in there, okay? Okay, Gene. So there's a couple questions here that I want to answer and some that I think we'll save for another day. So Keith asked about the VWAP, the volume weighted average price. Uh, Keith, we'll do a more advanced volume analysis sometime after the first year, and we'll look at that indicator. So I don't have time to do that today. Um, there's a question here about uh, uptrends uh, on low volume. Yeah, a lot of times you'll see that. Um, especially when you get near a highs, that it's a lot easier for the market to push higher on low volumes because there's really nobody here to stop them. Remember, think about in terms of 
force and momentum. If there's no sellers, then it doesn't take a lot of force to keep that momentum going. Now, there is an adage of something that goes like, bull markets are born on low volume and die on high volume and bear markets are born on high volume and die on low volume so there is some kind of correlation there so you you know the way we look what's going on in the markets right now um i think what it is is that right particularly today this low volume move to the upside might be more about algorithms that are in control and that you know market sentiment is still kind of bullish and that sellers, right, less force, right, that opposite force, have kind of just taken a back seat. Maybe we'll, maybe those folks that want to sell the market are waiting to see if we make a new all-time high, or wait to see if this momentum changes and maybe starts to drift to the to the lower side. Okay. Um, so Timothy asked something about the components of the BCMM again. Uh, Timothy, that is all equities. It's the big pictures, the ocean of equities, all right? Um, and yes, it is kind of just a decliner, advancer, right? In other words, uh, some there's some uh, technical analysis out there that's called thrust indicators or advanced uh, decline lines. It's very similar to that. So yeah, good question there, Timothy, all right? All right, so let's go on back to our slides. And whoops, seriously, not going back to our slides. <laughs> Let's go to inside the VIX. What is really going on inside the VIX? So I'm going to go to options market overview in the options section. And over here on the right, let me make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see this. Over here on the right, um, we have three ratios for you. And these are put to call ratio. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we look at the volume of put options and the volume of call options. And we divide the put volume by the call option, right? And that'll give us a ratio. Now, the first one is total. It's all, all equities. The second one is just indexes, and the third one is just equities themselves. Now, what we can do, similar to like what we looked at the VIX and that momentum indicator, is we can look at the range of these ratios and look at the extremes or the outliers as potential trading opportunities. Again, telling us the sentiment of the market has it swung too far to the upside or to the downside. So for instance, on in the index, you can see that the 52 week low is 0.84 and the 52 week high is um, 2.14. If I look at the equity ones, you can see that the numbers are a little bit different, uh, 0.34 versus um, 0.77. So if we had an equal amount of put volume versus equal amount of call volume, that number would be one. So any number below one means there's more call volume uh, than put volume. Now, what I want you to do is use these two bottom ones, right? So let's look at the equity put call ratio. I'm going to go to um, a chart here. And let me go back to six months here. So again, like our VIX, we can look for trading opportunities when this pull, put call ratio gets extended or gets to what we call it, you know, a high outlier extreme event. So normally for equities, you will see that the put call ratio will be, float somewhere between 0.4 to 0.6. And anything above 0.6 starts to become elevated. When you get to like 0.7 or above, that's telling you the market is very, very bearish. In other words, they're buying more puts than they are calls. And that could be an indication of a bottoming or a capitulation. On the downside, when you see that put call ratio get really compressed below 40, then that's telling you the market is very, very bullish in terms uh, buying calls and trading calls and not puts. Now, this is what I wanted to show you, and this is why I was at the two-year uh, time frame. 
So over the last year and a half, two years, we can see there's been a dynamic shift in this put call ratio. Now, I think this is because there's a lot more retail traders in the market and retail traders tend to trade more calls than puts. But you can, you can see this picture, this 40, 60 kind of range. But if we go back in time, you know, not too far distant past, that put call ratio was was more like the 50 70 right so that's why i say above 70 is really when you get those extreme events and really you got to get low down about below 30 uh to be um uh, that contrary um overbought scenario so you can see that that is where we kind of where we're at now so be aware of this this could dynamically shift maybe as the market moves forward right think about the market has only known since uh, 2012 an uptrend. So this is maybe a result of that. Let me go back to our options page. And we look at the indexes, put call ratios. Again, I'll go to my chart. And what we see here is we see much higher ratio. Now, the reason for that is that because indexes are a lot easier for large institutional investors to buy kind of blanket protection to the portfolios, right? So what we normally see is index options activity is there's a lot more put action than there is call actions in individual stocks. Right, you're gonna see a lot more call action than you're gonna see put action, right? So the skew is always higher and it's always in favor of the puts. But again, you can kind of see this range between, you know, maybe on the low end one or 120 here to the high end about 180. And again, this could be an indication of how traders look at the market. Now, we're not gonna use this one as a contrarian like we did with our VIX or what we did with the call index. In this one, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna think about it more about conviction and confidence. And what do I mean by that? Well, when it falls to extreme, to the downside, right, the lows, institutions are confident that prices are gonna rise. And when it rises, to the upside, we're buying more puts, more put action, then their conviction of adding more insurance, right? They want more protection. So what are we seeing today? Well, over the last two days, we've seen that it's falling, which could be a sign that we're seeing traders are buying back, their, or selling out of their puts, right? That they use for protection as the market is going higher, as they believe we're gonna go and test the, test the all-time highs. Now again, on a historical basis, you can see that over a period of time, and I think this is about the ETFization of markets, is this has shifted to the upside, unlike the call one that has shifted to the downside. So there has been a shift in this range of price. Matter of fact, I have an options friend who trades the VIX and he's telling me that even though the VIX is super low today, the cost of downside protection compared to a year ago is a lot more expensive, right? So even though volatility is low, the prices are a lot higher. And that's still telling me that there is this underlying sentiment that market believes that they need protection to the downside. But we are seeing this shift in the ETFization of the market towards more put action. Okay. Where are we out of time, Gene? Oh, oh perfect. Um, let's see a couple more questions. I don't see any new ones that popped up here. All right, so let me give you one little piece food for thought, all right? Again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't want to predict where markets are going to go. Um, 
my adage has always been I, I don't tell the market where it's going. I listen to what the market is telling me. And if you listen, the market will tell you uh, what it's going to do. So what are some of the takeaways? Well, no one sentiment or momentum indicator is more reliable than another, right? So again, it's a blend of different things. And you want to make sure that you don't rely on just one. Um, and that these indicators, these momentum and sentiment indicators, aren't absolute buy or sell signals, right? They only alert investors of potential buying opportunities. You still need other forms of confirmation, other technical analysis, chart analysis, volume analysis, um, trend recognition um, to give you that confidence that the indicator that we're looking at, that sentiment indicator is telling you that this is a buying or selling opportunity. Okay, so what I was saying about um, listening to what the market is telling me and not telling the market what to do, um, this is called the tulip chart or sometimes called the phases of uh, mania. And it shows how prices move from, you know, uh, accumulation, smart money, institutional, public, uh, this uh, immediate attention, enthusiasm, greed, delusion, new paradigm, denial, return to normal, then fear, then capitulation capitulation. Again, I'm not predicting things, but let's go back to our S&P index and let's do this. All right? This is from about 2009 when we started this major bull rally based on fiscal stimulus excuse me, monetary stimulus, excuse me. And if we look at this compared to this, and this compared to this, I'm not saying the market's gonna crash in fear and capitulation, but I'm just saying that if we don't make a new all-time high in a relatively short period of time, and price rolls back over and breaks the most recent low, that low that was created back here, I don't know. Okay, anything else you wanna add, Gino? I know what you wanna add, you're gonna add, <laughs> okay. We're gonna talk about next week. Yeah, <laughs> next week, cool. I also want you to show everybody the uh, revised webinar page. It's yeah, this bit, is really cool. Yeah, so for Go those ahead. of you who come back here uh, and and you're regulars to our weekly uh, webinar series, this page has been updated a little bit. Um, the next session, which John can talk about right now, is listed in the upcoming webinars tab right there, Long Strangle Options Strategy. And you can reserve your spot directly from this page. And then there's a tab for archived webinars. Today's session is actually, it's showing up right there at the top, but it's not quite ready. Uh, if you click on that link, the video will be posted there a little bit later on this afternoon and you will get an email uh, when it's ready. But you'll also notice top right, it says download slides PDF. So John's slides are gonna be available for you. They're actually available right now. You can download them if you if you wanna review them. But um, yeah, so our, our archive has been uh, kind of rearranged. You can sort by topic and so on. So uh, take, take, take a peek and look, look around, see what you see. Not only has it been updated, but folks, we got to take our hats off to Jean. She's done a really great job. It's really, really very more uh, user friendly, right? Um, in terms of you can check uh, topics, right? Um, the other thing is, you know, you can look at 
what is the information that you're going to perceive in this webinar? Is it an advanced? Is it intermediate? Also, you know, what other relatable subjects? Maybe, you know, this one webinar we had a we did a webinar beforehand that builds into it. So, you know, relatable topics. So it is really, really supercharged. And I got to give uh, kudos to my partner here and great job, Gene. This is really looks really, really cool. And I'm really excited about how this is going to expand as we move forward too. As hey, well. gee, gee, thanks. You know, one more thing I want to point out, if you, look, for instance, use your top-down chart analysis as a example, John, third one down, uh, these now allow you, if you need closed captions, uh, it's actually the, the um, YouTube video. So there's lots of different options down there. If you hover over the bottom right corner of the video, you can turn on um, yep, I think maybe you have to click on it or something, but uh, you, you can turn closed captions on, there it goes, uh, or put it out full screen. Uh, John, you're going to start with the, yeah, you can exit out of here. <laughs> anyway, lots, lots of improvements. Please check them out. Oh, that's too want, funny. <laughs> and do you want to talk about next, next, uh, next week's session? Yeah, sure. So next week we're going to talk about um, continuing in a series of our option strategies. We're going to be looking at uh, long strangles. Um, and really this one is a little bit more of a difficult option strategy. It's not very favored among a lot of traders, but we're going to look about the aspects of, you know, what are the risks, how we can look to set it up. And uh, I'm going to give you some tips about what types of technical analysis that you can use to find these candidates that could be poised for big price explosions and take advantage using this uh, option strategy. Okay. All right. So I think that's about it, Gene. Uh, so let me say, you know, be safe out there, folks. Uh, best of health and the good of all trading. Thank you again, everybody, for visiting barchart.com and being part of these sessions each Wednesday. We hope to see you again soon. Bye now.